In almost every country, the first check and interpretation of the cervical mirror lies with the cytotechnologist. He or she is allowed to report the diagnosis of normal pattern of benign lesion. However, whenever there is uncertainty, the cytotechnologist must refer to the pathologist, who may assume the responsibility for the diagnosis of malignancy. Before checking the smear, read carefully the patient's data record collected by the sampling midwife. The following information is needed. 1. Patient's age and menopausal status. 2. Parity. 3. Day of the menstrual cycle when the sample was collected. The most appropriate time is between the 10th and the 21st day. 4. Oral contraception. 5. Intrauterine device which may affect the endocervical cytology to the metaplasia. 6. Gynecological surgeries. 7. Previous Papa Nicolau test reports and colposcopies. 8. Completed or ongoing radiotherapy. The desquamation of the epithelium of the cervix provides two kinds of cells. 1. Squamous cells. 2. Endocervical glandular cells. In the squamous cells, the color of cytoplasms, blue, gray, red, orange, etc., is not very important. Actually, it depends on the staining and the woman's hormonal status. Normal mature squamous cells are polygonal in shape with some folds. The nucleus cytoplasm ratio is very low. No nuclear membrane visible. The shape of the nuclei round or regularly polygonal. The chromatin uniformly distributed and normochromic. Whenever isolated in the smear, the endocervical glandular cells are cylindrical in shape, with their nucleus at one pole and the cytoplasm at the other pole, with cilia. The endocervical glandular cells are smaller, the texture of the chromatin more loose than the squamous cells so that the nuclear membrane and the nucleolus may be visible. The cytoplasm is stained blue or grey, but never take on bright colours. Whenever in clusters, then the cervical glandular cells are polygonal in shape and so tight one to another to give honeycomb appearance. Within the cytological normal pattern, we mention the metaplastic transformations of the glandular cells. Actually, the cytoplasm may turn into squamous while getting more opaque. The differential diagnosis between glandular metaplastic cell and squamous cell of the deepest layers is difficult. The latter may have a pale orange perinuclear halo. Conversely, the offshoots of the glandular cell, either single, or so multiple to give the appearance of a spider cell are a significant mark of glandular cell metaplasia. Whenever hormonal stimulation is lost, as in menopausal women, cells do not grow mature and atrophy takes place. Basically, atrophic cells have a higher nucleocytoplasm ratio than normally, just because the cytoplasm is poor. However, the chromatin is not so hypochromic as in malignancies. The adequacy of the sample is assessed through random examination of the smear, magnified to a power of 100. A good amount of cells, both squamous and glandular, isolated or in clusters, should be seen. The cytotechnologist is also required to report about adequacy in terms of 1. Artifacts of air bubble trap during fixation 2. Undue pressure while smearing 3. Crystals of powder from surgical gloves 4. Dust 5. Air 6. Cotton fibers, etc. The second random overview with a power magnification of 200, or even 400 if necessary, focuses on 1. Atrophy, as mentioned above, 2. High number of granulocytes as an evidence of bacterial infection, 3. Mycelian spores in extracellular spaces as an evidence of fungal infection. 
4. Papillomavirus caused coelocytosis. Coelocytes are squamous cells with a perinuclear pearly white halo and hyperkeratosis. They are often binuclear or polynuclear cells. 5. Morula-like clusters disclosing herpes simplex virus infection. 6. Black cocard corpse inside cytoplasm vacuoles disclosing chlamydia infection. 7. Trichomonas vaginalis. From this point forward, while focusing on the oncological pattern, the smear is checked like a book, starting from top left to right, and thereafter in a similar fashion from top to bottom. For both squamous and endocervical glandular cells, the dysplastic features are detected only through the morphology of the nuclei, namely 1. Increased nucleocytoplasm ratio 2. Asymmetrical diameters, sometimes with notches 3. Increased thickness of the nuclear membrane. 4. Hyperchromia and irregular distribution of the chromatin. 5. Evidence for squamous or hypertrophy for glandular of the nucleoli. Moreover, for the squamous cells, the increased aggregation in clusters is held as an additional dysplastic feature. About the epithelial cell increasing abnormalities, we refer to the classification of Bethesda, 2001. In the atypical squamous cell of undetermined significance, the acronym is ASCUS, the nuclei are only slightly larger, with some hyperchromia, as shown in the red circle, in comparison to the normal squamous cells in the green circle. With a power magnification of 400, the chromatin appears distributed irregularly. One cell shows the salt and pepper distribution. Two nuclei show nuclear notches. In this sample, the amount of ASCUS cells is higher, spread in several groups. By increasing magnification, hyperchromic nuclei are visible in ASCUS in comparison to normal cells. Some coelocytes may also be observed. In the atypical squamous cell of a high grade, the acronym is ASCH, the abnormal cells are usually fewer than in ASCUS. The nuclei are mostly as in ASCUS. The upgrading to diagnose ASCH is given when a. The color orange of some cytoplasms suggests hyperkeratosis, b. The nuclear membranes are thicker, c. Small clusters are seen, d. As it appears in these three cells, the shape of the nuclei is asymmetrical. In low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, the acronym is LCIL, both nuclei and cytoplasms are larger than in ASCH. Coelocytosis is likely to be seen. Clusters are common. Here, a three coelocyte cluster is shown. Coelocytes and dysplastic l -cell cells are both evident in this light. In high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, the acronym is h -cell. Coelocytes are rare. Big clusters of dysplastic cells cover the majority of this light, with the exception of the normal squamous cells on the top. Beyond the nuclear features already remarked, the cells are smaller than in l -cell. The nucleocytoplasm ratio is so high that the cytoplasm may be a mere perinuclear ring. The shape of the whole cell is so asymmetrical that some of them are comma-shaped or of so elongated a shape that give a muscular cell appearance. The combination of asymmetrical shape of the cell and its nucleus gives the impression that the tissue has lost any orientation. H cell is not discernible from squamous cancer.
With regards to the glandular cells, the dysplastic grading is related to 1. The amount of dysplastic cells 2. The increasingly smaller size of the cells 3. The amount of bare nuclei 4. The number of dysplastic cell clusters 5. The size and number of the nucleoli 6. The thickness of the nuclear membrane Whenever the cells are severely dysplastic, it's even hard to assess whether the cell is squamous or glandular. In the atypical glandular cell, the acronym is AGC, the nuclei are only a bit larger and the nuclear membrane slightly more evident than normal. Large nuclei are likely to be seen. Cells may be aggregated in clusters. However, in atypical glandular cell suspicious for cancer, the acronym is AGC neoplastic, the nuclei and thickness of the nuclear membrane are very evident. In adenocarcinoma, the full malignant pattern is seen. Occasionally, even two nucleoli are present. Sometimes the clusters of cells maintain the glandular pattern. Thus, the adenomere is still visible and the cells show a palisade-like arrangement.